We all know that the death care market is changing, so why are you sticking to the same old marketing strategies? Inertia Marketing and Design knows death care and handles the marketing needs for hundreds of cemeteries, funeral homes, and industry suppliers. From email campaigns, websites, and social media presences to printed materials, promotions, branding, and public relations, Inertia is your turnkey solution to elevate your brand and reach your customer base. Find Inertia Marketing online at www.inertia.marketing or call death care marketing expert John Navicus at 888-552-IDEA, extension 113. That is 888-552-4332, extension 113. Inertia Marketing and Design. Brands in motion, stay in motion. Hi, I am Tony Russo, and this is Funeral Service Insider from Kate Spoilston. Each episode features conversations about emerging trends and news that affect the death care industry. We talk to people who understand the delicate balance of change in a profession and vocation steeped in tradition. This week, I'm speaking with Barbara Chemis, the Executive Director of the Cremation Association of North America, about NIMBYs, the not-in-my-backyard people who always seem to find their way to town meetings when it's time to talk about crematories. Um, She presents a lot of really good tactics for, for heading this kind of thing off at the pass, and there's plenty to be said about it. I do want to ask you to stick around after the credits for the postmortem, where I'm going to talk about a big NIMBY situation that is going on in Minnesota. Um, and also, I'll tell you how to reach me if you would like to participate, leave a message, leave comments, any of those things. Um, but let's just get started with Barbara, because this is a great conversation. She's always great to talk to. One of the things, one of the first stories that I wrote as uh, the new editor of Funeral Service Insider, was about a woman who had purchased her childhood church, it's the one that her father bought, to turn into a funeral home. And when someone found out that they were going to put a crematory in the funeral home, uh, the neighbors lost their minds. And she went from this woman who grew up in town to this outsider who was swooping in to try and poison their water and their air and kill all of their children. And it's something that everyone faces when it's something that many people face when they try to open a crematory and dealing with your neighbors is just gonna remain a fact of life. And so this week, what we want to talk about is some of the ways that you can deal with uh, your neighbors. <laughs> and and uh, Barbara Cannabis mm-hmm. has joined us to do that. Hello. Hello, Tony. Good to be with you. And so talk to me a little bit about some of the main problems, some of the some of the underlying problems when it comes to opening a crematory in um, and certainly in a residential area. But just I mean, at this point now, if it's if it's in the county, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, probably. The story you told is is so familiar. Um, it fits a pattern that that we've seen over time. So there's there's an, three kind of categories of opposition for for cremation, and one is emissions, which you mentioned that you know somehow the crematory um, you know is going to pump those emissions directly into the lungs of school children mm-hmm. was actual testimony a member experienced at a zoning committee and said it with a straight face I mean they really truly believe that right yeah so um, there's a lot of misinformation about emissions and misunderstanding of what actually comes out of a crematory and you know okay so we can we can tackle that. But then there's other things like property value. That's a popular argument uh, that the, that somehow their property values are going to decrease. Um, and then there's just the ick factor. 
And the ick factor can include lots of things. A recent argument was around increased traffic. You know, people want to witness cremations now. And now, you know, we put in this crematory and we're just going to have, there's not enough parking. We're going to have, you know, the road backed up and that's dangerous for our children. An actual argument in a recent (laughs) case as well. So um, there's, those are kind of the three categories and the common theme among them is there's very few facts presented by the opposition and a lot of emotion. And that's a real takeaway is like the story you wrote. Here's a respected person in the community trying to give back to her community. And by you know implementing plans to put in a crematory, all of a sudden they're a villain. And it's like, wow, whiplash, right? Right. One of the things that continues to to be an issue is sometimes people don't need one more fact. And, you know, some, sometimes when, when you have this kind of visceral reaction against something, uh, sometimes the best way is to undo that visceral reaction. Have you seen any success with that? Like, is there any kind of pre-outreach or outreach that people do that kind of hedges against this, uh, this gut reaction? Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. And some some tips um, that we can offer based on uh, research we published a few years ago in 2017 from some uh, from the University of Central Oklahoma. They did a study of the media coverage of two uh, new crematoria that were planned for and both were defeated. Uh, it's spoiler alert, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's well covered. They wanted to understand what, you know, what were the factors, what was in common, what was, you know, what were the kind of threads, common threads among both situations. And, and basically what the results were um, consider and, and plan for a public relations campaign, meaning reach out to your neighbors, whether businesses or residential and identify that you're planning to do this and why. Make the business case ahead of time and see how people re- respond. And what's fascinating is they identified a difference for, um, so for example, if you proactively go and say, hey, I'm your longtime neighbor and you know, we have this wonderful funeral home. I believe we've served your family, you know, whatever the truth is. And we're planning on putting in a crematory. Cremation rates, rates have risen proactively when it's theoretical, usually there's no problem, right? Mm. Um, There was one of our manufacturers gave an example of a zoning hearing that he represented the customer there. And the customer had basically gone to the local news proactively and said, we're going to expand and do this and make the business case. And that local reporter had gone to, there was a competitor across town and that local reporter had gone to a resident who lived next to the competitor and asked, did you know you live within 150 feet of a, of a crematory? And the person said, nope, had no idea. Have you had any problems with smoke or odor, traffic, lower home values? Nope, nope, not that I know of. And so the reporter reported the story and, you know, that and a lot of other preparation and everything, but the, the um, placement, the licensing for the crematory was successful. So there's examples of how that can benefit. But once opposition is organized and in place, it is very challenging because then it becomes emotional. Logic goes out the window, it seems like, and it's it's very difficult. Well, well, I actually live about four blocks from a crematory, and it never even occurred to me until I took this job. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. there. It's people have this kind of this kind of vision of you know smokestacks or or things like that that just aren't aren't the case. When people start to plan an expansion, for example, uh, in addition to in addition to setting up the neighbors, is there is there any value in kind of showing drawings of what it might look like, or or that kind of that kind of preemptive? This is what changes will come to the neighborhood for sure. Oh yes, oh a hundred percent. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? So, you know, especially if if it's um, converting. Well, I shouldn't say especially. There are instances where if you're if you're adding or converting a garage site to a crematory, that was was very common in the 80s into the 90s, probably still true because that's mm-hmm. you know that's kind of an optimal space. Um, I think it's also important to talk about the increase in 
people choosing cremation who want to view their cremation and the convenience and security of having the crematory on site. So that can be part of the, the service provided to the families that the funeral home serving. That's both emotional and logical. Um, you know, the, but I think images, sure. I think any kind of traffic studies that might be done in advance. And there is a common misperception um, that that somehow mm. crematories are unregulated. And it stems from the fact that the U.S. Environmental Protective Agency, the U.S. EPA, declined in around 1999, 2000, to regulate at the federal level and instead delegated regulation of crematories to the state levels. And so um, the, the state agencies that have various names, um, sometimes EPA, but various names, or air quality districts, if you're a large state like California and divide up into to separate sections, um, they'll, they will regulate crematories by issuing air permits and your manufacturer can um, supply emission studies for the, the specific model and type of machine that you might be buying. So you can get some of these this information about emissions and experiences that others have had perhaps in the same state or in a, in a neighboring state, you know, within the region around emissions and proactively state, you know, our stack is going to be this tall. It will not be an eyesore. It will be mm -hmm. insulated to, you know, <laughs> kind of lay out some facts in advance about how this is, you know, people fear the unknown, right? People really, who doesn't fear the unknown? What does this mean? So um, I think that facts and logic can have an impact in advance of any opposition campaign, but that doesn't stop people from opposing uh, placement of crematories too. One of the interesting things for me from kind of an outsider's perspective is this idea of safety and, uh, and security. Because, I, I mean, it's you have funeral directors that you know have to, for whatever reason, outsource their cremations, and who's ever doing the cremation is you know always going to always going to do their their best and always going to work their hardest. But it's 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 interesting. I think it says a lot about funeral directors that in the back of their head they're like. I'm not comfortable handing over my responsibility to someone else, even though I do it every day and I have to, you know, there is that, mm -hmm. there is that nervous, like they're more, more like it's a dereliction than they don't trust the other guy. You know what I mean? I, I think that's a piece of it. But the number one question that consumers ask about cremation is how do I know this is my loved one? Right. Mm. How do I know? And that stems from grief and not really a lack of trust of their cremation provider. Um, I, I have told the story in different ways that I had a friend whose husband died and uh, he wanted to have a witness cremation and he wanted to wait until after the cremation. And he didn't drive. So we drove him down to the crematory, had the witness cremation, went and had lunch, got him a little drunk, celebrated his husband's life. Three hours later, come back to pick up his cremated remains and the beautiful piece of pottery he had brought for that purpose were we get in the car and the first question he's asked is how do I know this is my husband? Mm. I mean, there couldn't have been more safeguards in place to ensure that that was his husband. That was grief speaking. And so whenever there's, you know, again, we fear the unknown, right? So whenever there's a little bit of distance between uh, or, um, or misunderstanding or lack of clarity about, you know, where the cremation is taking place, there's a risk. There's a risk of, of that miscommunication with the consumer and that sparks their fear. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right, Tony. You live in New Jersey. Funeral homes can't own crematories in New Jersey. They have to be on nonprofit cemetery property. And there's a number of states with statutes in place like that. Um, I live in Chicago, Illinois. By statute in, sh in Chicago, there cannot be a crematory in the city. So crematories are all around the edge of the city of Chicago serving funeral homes in Chicago. So you pick cremation and you die in Chicago, you're going to be cremated elsewhere. And that's just kind of the rules that we have to follow. So there's no, again, there's no rational reason why I as a funeral home owner can't outsource my cremations. That's That may be a, the best business decision for me to be compliant with laws, but also, you know, for a number of other factors. 
and yet you still have to have an answer to where is that cremation taking right. place and what is the chain of custody and, you know, be able to explain all of that to, to kind of counter that fear. And so, you know, that's that's one example of advice I offer is know what the opposition is going to say. Because ironically, some of the, the strongest voices about not in my backyard are people who choose cremation, have chosen cremation. Mm. Um, a common testimony, a theme um, for people who oppose crematory placement is, I don't want to, I chose cremation for my husband or my person, fill in the blank of the relationship. I don't want a constant reminder of their death. I don't want to have to see that crematory every day, you know, so not mm-hmm. across the parking lot, not on the corner, as if somehow that's going to, you know, um, uh, amplify their grief, right? They're already grieving mm. and they've already chosen cremation. So, you know, they're not against it full full stop, mm-hmm. but, um, but somehow, you know, so that's what I mean. It's not countering logic or counting emotion with logic and facts isn't always a factor. Right. Um, another another really important thing to identify is uh, is to identify the zoning process well in advance and um, hire an attorney who knows the zoning yeah. process to explore. Don't buy the equipment first or buy the land and the machine and, and then and then go through that. That's unfortunately there's lots of examples of kind of putting the cart before the horse and and just assuming everything's going to be okay. I mean, I haven't heard any of those recently. I think nobody assumes anymore. It's well known, the challenges. But when you know the zoning process, one key factor is, is the committee, the zoning committee or board, whatever they're called, are they appointed by, say, the city manager or the county supervisor or even the governor in some cases? Are they appointed or are they elected? Ah. Okay huge, huge difference. Um, Some people will say, if you're dealing with a zoning board that's elected, give up, don't even try. It's just never going to happen because they're constantly running for election and or raising money and and just may never support that. I mean, I'm not one to give up, but that's definitely a factor. See if you can set up meetings, you know, in advance to see or or check. uh, The attorney will help you check notes from past you know, past meetings to see if businesses like yours, there's, there are businesses like crematories, mm-hmm. right? There, I mean, crematories are unique, sure, but there are other businesses that have uh, raised emissions concerns and things like that. So you can do your homework a bit in advance, but it will be harder if they're elected and not appointed, for sure. Okay, we're going to take a little break now because I want to tell you about an upcoming event from Case Boylston the Funeral Service Business Planning Conference. The event is slated for October 24th and October 25th in Virginia Beach, Virginia at the Delta Hotels by Marriott. It's a transformative gathering exclusively for funeral home owners and operators. It'll offer valuable insights, expert guidance, and networking opportunities. Attendees can gain access to the presentations and lively discussions led by renowned industry leaders. They'll be covering topics such as industry trends, marketing strategies, operational efficiencies, and personalized services. By attending this conference, funeral directors can enhance their skills, expand their professional network, and stay ahead of industry developments. Ultimately, it will help you elevate your funeral service business to new levels. Register today at katesboylston.com on the events page. You can find the link in the show notes. Um, Right now, I mean, October is far away, so there is an early bird discount. So the earlier you make your choice, the cheaper it'll be for you. All right, well, let's get back to the show. Before we before we came on, I had had told you about a a story that I'm covering about Mm -hmm. a, a, a crematory that just won after after years in court um and one of the one of the one of the objections was that incinerators weren't zoned in the in the area Ex- incinerators were excluded from the zoning mm-hmm. and the judge just had to make a judgment call about whether or not uh retort counted as an incinerator mm-hmm. and he said something like incineration is going on but this isn't this is kind of spirit of the law, letter of the law. This isn't what they meant by incinerator. You know, they meant we don't want a garbage incinerator. They didn't mean 
that we don't want a crematory was was his take on it. And, you know, there was a lot of people who were up in arms, but this funeral home is finally able to go forward and again, and to serve the people, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the very people who were who were trying to keep it from happening now have the security of knowing this this gentleman that I'm speaking of. It was um, I, I, I looked it up so that so that I could I could say it <laughs> correctly. It was the uh, Vaughn Green Funeral Services. It's in North Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And he has he has a couple of places. And rather than having to move the bodies from place to place, he wanted to open an additional one to keep up with demand and also even to reduce his own, you know, margin of error in yes. in moving and moving bodies from place to place, even within the company. Yep. Uh, I mean, that that is so interesting and, and exciting. Breaking news. You heard it here <laughs> first. That's really, really exciting that he was successful. And it sounds like that fits the business plan, his business plan perfectly. And I am excited, frankly, to hear that that crematories, at least in this instance, were not um, lumped into incinerators because... That's a common argument that the opposition will make. There's a there's a website too. I, I I'm not giving away any secret I, about this website. I look at it frequently, and I did look at it again in preparation for this conversation. And um, it's 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 I think it was established like back in like 2011 or something or 20 or the early 2010s, let's say. And the it's called No, and then the number two crematory.wordpress.com. And I do not know who established this website, but it is a treasure trove of fake news, fake science, <laughs> and a whole bunch of arguments against crematories. And so this is exactly what the opposition is referencing, sometimes word for word. And so I am by no means promoting this website, but you need to know what people are going to say against you. Like they're going to say, um, you know, Basically, bodies are toxic and they shouldn't. We don't need to breathe the smoke that generates from them. Okay, I'm. Is that 100% true? Of course not. There is nuance. Um, a crematory designed to cremate humans is different than a garbage incinerator or a medical waste incinerator, right? Or or mm-hmm. di- or even a plastic manufacturing plant that's using a different kind of incineration to get rid of waste. Like all of these are different. But if you're trying to if the opposition is just trying to appeal to emotion, they'll look at websites like this. And the funniest part of this website to me is there's a graphic at the top of a of a train, okay? And each of the cars of the train have the reasons why cremation is increasing in popularity. And the Kena logo is on the engine of the, <laughs> of the train. And um, no, we do not endorse this website or have anything to do with it. <laughs> Let me state that very clearly. I am only talking about it because it's kind of funny, but also you need to know what the arguments are against this if, you, if you're going to pursue this as part of your business plan. Some of the things are true in that cremation rates do increase um, steadily, right? About one and a half percent a year is what we've observed over the past few years. Mm-hmm. And um, probably going to be slowing down as we exceed 60% nationally, but still increase. So we can expect increased cremation rates. Um, so that part's true. And I guess, you know, are we persuading people to choose cremation? Of course not. Consumers are leading that. Right. Uh, Kana's not the engine. It should be consumers, <laughs> there, but it's still funny. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I think it's one thing we have noticed, though, is that uh, over the last four years, um, The number, we count the number of crematories and the national numbers have decreased. It used to be about 150 to 200 new crematories were put in place, you know, between like 2015 and 2019. And then the last several years, it's only been 100 Mm. crematories per year. Some states like California, it's basically full stop. I mean, there's... Good luck trying right. to place a, a flame crematory anyway, right? These zoning challenges and opposition have been effective in some cases, but I like to hear positive stories too. One of the things I, I just to follow up on what you said, one of one of the things that we that I learned in in college is kind of a rhetorical thing is once you you have to accept the other person's argument and you have to make it for them so that you know 
how they mm-hmm. feel about it. And that's where you're going to find the cracks in the argument. Just knowing it's wrong sometimes isn't enough, but knowing how you would feel that way and then what it would take to reconvince you is sometimes a very useful way to look at sticky problems like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you say that uh, the number of cre- crematories itself has gone down, could it, could it also be like a balancing as as the rates as the rate of cremation ap- approaches cuz I'm sorry I don't want to put words in your mouth but did you tell me it's like you guys feel like it'll top out at 80ish percent I mean eventually Yeah so um so we're our magazine, our annual statistics report in our uh, cremationist magazine is at the printers as we record this. So by the time this runs, uh, it'll be public. So I'm just going to say it. Um, we're saying the 2022 national cremation rate is is 59%. So just shy of, of 60%. And we know the growth rate kind of looks like a an S curve or imagine like a lightning bolt kind of thing, mm-hmm. right? So it hasn't been a hockey stick kind of growth over time. Hundred year, It took 100 years from the first cremation to 5%. And then from 5% to 50% was less than 50 years, okay, 45 years to hit 50%. So that was incredible. You know, that was pretty steep growth and rapid growth. And now it's starting to slow down as we exceed 60%. And we expect that another long tail um, never reaching 100%, of course, probably around 80%. And we're starting to see some evidence of plateauing that I talk about in the magazine article a bit too, already in states that are over 80%. More than 10 states have, are showing evidence of plateauing and they, they're starting in the high 60 to low 80%. We're seeing cremation rates kind of flattening out, um, but most of the country is still in a, a kind of um, rapid growth or deceleration stage. So I think what you're also asking about, though, is capacity, right? right? In states like New Jersey and others where uh, the placement of crematories is limited to cemeteries, when I say that the numbers have changed, like in New Jersey, the numbers pretty much stayed the same for years, right? There's not, because I'm talking about a licensed crematory, right? there could be five machines under that rooftop. There could be one machine under that rooftop. The point is it's a licensed business. Mm -hmm. In states like Illinois, where there there are no such restrictions, a funeral home, if they can survive the zoning process, can put one, you know, in their backyard or on on a different property or what have you. And they may do that, but obviously maybe they would only have one machine because they're just doing 150, 200 cremations a year. So it's, you know, there's, there's variance there. Um, so when I say it's a, roughly 100 new crematories nationally, I mean businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what we're seeing is to accommodate capacity is we're seeing um, is established businesses add machines under the same rooftop so they can serve more and, uh. and handle that capacity. That's not evident in these numbers. That's anecdotal evidence from our members. Mm-hmm. And then it's just harder to get a new license for a new business, and 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 if not impossible in some parts of the country. Uh, so that's where I mean I think we're gonna you know we're at the number we published for um, 2022 was 3,451 <laughs> crematories nationally. It was 3,352 the year before, so it's about a hundred difference. I think that's gonna flatten out. Um, you know, as well as like, basically we have the capacity. And we learned that during the pandemic, that was a really hard lesson to learn. And there were horrible stories and experiences of delayed cremation, sometimes for weeks. Mm. But ultimately we did have the capacity um, to, you know, to cremate all of the dead during the worst of the, the pandemic. Any new crematory placement is not, could be to address capacity questions. You can still make that business case but is is mm-hmm. probably more likely to um, expand the business model of the owner. And along those lines, it's I didn't know those numbers. So it's it's shocking to me because they seem low given how many funeral homes mm-hmm. there are. Yeah. 
Because there are something like 19,000 funeral homes, right? Is that is that a real number? Did um, I make no, that I've up? heard the similar number. And I'm, I'm curious. I don't I don't know the source of that. You know, I'm always about citing source. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the source of that. But let, yeah, let's go with 19,000. And of those 34, 51, 3,451 crematories, many of them are on cemetery property and have nothing to do with the funeral home. Um you know, some of our largest members are whether they're on a you know a cemetery or uh, what is often referred to as a third-party crematory. Um, you know, serve a dozen or more funeral homes, and so they'll be by serving. I mean, they do removals and maybe trade embalming and cremations for a num, and mm-hmm. that's such a common model, especially in an urban area, not exclusively urban, but it's such a common model. Um, kind of makes sense. Excellent. Well, we're kind of up against it. And I did want to take a minute to ask you about the upcoming uh, conference because I went last year. It was the first, uh, it was the first attended. It's the first funeral service conference that I en- oh, ever right. attended and it set a pretty high okay. bar for me uh because I, I I absolutely I absolutely had a blast so can you tell us about your your upcoming your your upcoming event yeah in we're in Washington DC at the um the Hyatt Capitol Hill and for for a long time fan of Cana convention it's the same hotel we were at 10 years ago we celebrated our 100th anniversary 10 years ago. So now it's our 110th. So that's roughly, you know, it's, we're going to touch on celebrating Cana and, um, and all things cremation, as we always do. Uh, we hope you'll join us. But if you haven't, aren't familiar with the Cana event, we're the smallest of the national conventions. We attract between 300 and 350 people. And our our philosophy of our convention is is the same as our philosophy of an association. We come together to talk about cremation. We're all in this together. So we're all in one ballroom, exhibits, learning, eating, and we feed you and open bars. <laughs> and we do it all together. <laughs> and so um, that's August 9th through 11th, again, in, in Washington, D.C. Our program is up on our website, www.cremationassociation.org. And I, I hope you'll join us. Uh, we don't. We won't specifically talk about nimbyism. Not in my backyard, but that's a common theme. With a, mm. it's a little easier to talk about it with a drink in your hand sometimes. And we'll talk about <laughs> a lot of strategies. Um, we're really excited, though. We've had a, a number of new members who have, um, especially from southern states, who have joined Cana and put in their new crematories, and they'll come often to the convention to compare notes. So it's just a great networking opportunity, even if you've been doing this for a long time or you're considering placement. This is this is our addition of a crematory to your business model. Consider coming and talking about this. And I don't want to put you on a spot because we are doing this well, well in advance, but uh, do you have speakers lined up? Do you have any speakers that you want to tease? Oh, we do. We have, um, we're doing a, okay, my favorite is always our statistics and research. We always <laughs> you, that's a, well, first, figure. If I could do a commercial for you, that's a really good presentation. <laughs> I mean, I probably got 10 stories out of just sitting there for the 45 yeah. minutes you were talking. Well, so thanks. That was a really valuable, valuable So, So we'll talk about our annual statistics, statistics report and what's changed and what hasn't, but we're also partnering with a wonderful company called McKee Wallwork out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they do a a study every 10 years called IDEALS. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what the acronym stands for. But they they basically uh, survey consumers and buying patterns and all sorts of things. And they come up with these avatars that describe you know, who is who is uh, the funeral consumer and what do they want and what appeals to them. So it's that coupled with the consumer research that we did last year is going to give a really, on, cremo- on cremation memorialization, um, is going to give a really robust view as to like current consumer trends and, and what are we doing. So I'm really excited about that. I'm waving my hands around a lot, which you can't see because the presentation doesn't <laughs> exist yet, but it will by August 10th, I promise. And um, 
we have, we have a, a number of great presenters, mainly talking about other topics we're talking about are recruitment and retention of workers. That's on everybody's mind. Um, using technology to create efficiencies. And uh, because if you can't find people, what can you do to empower them, right? The, your existing people to, to work mm. smarter and not necessarily harder. Uh, we always do a cemetery tour. And this year we are going to Arlington National Cemetery and we'll lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So that will be the Friday afternoon. Um, and we'll have you know, a great roundup of exhibitors and very generous sponsors who um, are donating prizes. We play a game. It's a passport game. So come and and win fabulous prizes. And Kate Boylston will be exhibiting. Thank you very much. So um, you can can come and meet Tony too, perhaps. Unfortunately, you can't. I'm on vacation that week. I was so disappointed. The moment I thought it's a family vacation, it's not just me going away. That's a good excuse. Family first. I I acknowledge that. only conference that that you know instead i'm going to end up you know probably having to go to to some other less fun oh conference. you're sweet but you will meet others from kate boylston <laughs> so so do yes, do yes. consider coming um i'll be there for sure can't wait to see everybody it's like a big family reunion every year with 80 percent of the attendees are new first-time attendees so it's all about making new friends too <laughs> excellent well thank you so much and we're gonna have you back real soon so um th- thank Thanks, you thank Tony. you for joining us. it was us. a pleasure Thanks for listening to Funeral Service Insider, the podcast, sponsored by Inertia Marketing and Design. If your funeral home, cemetery, or death care industry service is looking to get your brand into motion, Inertia Marketing and Design is your answer. Inertia handles all your marketing, online, social media, and public relations needs in one place. Discover an accelerated solution to make your brand stand out in the death care crowd. Find Inertia online at www.inertia.marketing or call death care marketing expert John Navickis at 888-552-IDEA, extension 113. That's 888-552-4332, extension 113. Inertia Marketing and Design. Brands in Motion, Stay in Motion. Funeral Service Insider, the podcast, is a Kate Spoilston production. It was written and edited by me, Tony Russo. If you have any feedback on this show or on any of our shows, you can shoot me an email. My email address is a. Russo, R-U-S-S-O, at K like kite, B like boy, publications.com. You can also leave me a voicemail at 732-746-0201, or you can do both if you'd like. You can record a message on your phone and email it to me at the address I mentioned. I'll play the ones that are appropriate, and we can continue to have this conversation. And as always, I'd like to remind you that if you have not subscribed on your phone, please do so that this show comes up right away and you get to listen to it first thing every other Monday morning. Now, here's the postmortem. Usually this is made up of stories that are part of the In Case You Missed It section of Funeral Service Insider, but this is more like a story that I'm working on. And when I finish the story, I'll put it in the show notes. So if you're listening in the future, you can click on it. The state of Minnesota has put a moratorium on adding green burial cemeteries for the next two years, while it studies what kind of damage a human body does when it's decomposing in the ground outside of a coffin. It is the result of lobbying by about six guys in a very small town in Minnesota And I spoke with the senator that put it through today, and she had no idea that there was a controversy, only that someone asked her to sign this bill, which is American politics at its best. What's shocking is that in initial reporting, they said that there was an exception for religious burials. For instance, a Jewish or a Muslim cemetery could still be opened. Um, But the senator corrected me on that. No cemetery for any reason can open unless they're going to put caskets in the ground in that cemetery or, you know, cremated remains in uh, columbaria or niches or anything like that. And it is just mind boggling to me. So you can look it up. The, The links to the current 
reporting on it are all in the show notes, as well as the reporting that I did on this particular town of, I'm going to say it, Kooks, last year. But before we lay this all at the feet of a lazy legislature that can't be bothered to do any research before they sign a bill that's put in front of them, we should remember that this was announced and no one from the funeral industry came to the hearings. It also feels like since it's just a green burial cemetery, people are having trouble getting upset or excited. But the backstory is the county tried to kick a business out of town and when it failed and the county lawyers refused to do anything, they went to the legislature and said, could you sign this please so we can keep this business from opening up? And the legislature signed it just just like it was a sitcom. It's, uh, it's interesting. So make sure you catch this story this week. And until next time, thank you for listening to Funeral Service Insider, the podcast. Mm-hmm.